Jump King that game. Something ain't right about that dang thing. Okay. Let's pick up with our reading series. Perfect way to end Saturday. Alright. And thank you to Charles for the guide. I think a lot of that game Jump King is just like it's like mu it's like memory and muscle memory basically it's like remembering the correct thresholds for you to jump in yeah as I've said it's like sometimes with the controller it's hard to like use the correct amount of pressure on the button. Yeah. Part of it is like operator and part of it is instrument. Uh, but yeah. I'm practicing a lot in piano, you guys. Use it is the song I'm currently working on. Blade, I think I've got it down. I might be able to showcase some of it for you all soon, maybe even as soon as tomorrow. Uh, but yeah, I'd say stay tuned on that. Use it. I am learning more advanced version of the song. I've learned the A section already and. The B section's right hand section. I'm piecing together the left hand part. So hopefully when that's down, I'll have a new song to show for you guys. A new song to play. But yeah, much like my Jump King gameplay, it is very much a work in progress. So I appreciate you standing by in the meantime. Okay, and today in Sapiens, we'll be taking a look at the chapter of Mice and Men. Mice and Men is, of course, a novel by John Steinbeck. And from what I recall, it's about two characters, Lenny and, let's see, um, I think Carl is the other character's name. Let me take a quick look. John Steinbeck, yeah. Lenny Small and George Milton, okay. And I don't really remember too much about it. It's set during the Great Depression and they're moving in California in search of job opportunities of mice and men. I remember George being the more, I think I read this back in high school, and George was the more savvy character, Lenny is the more simple character. At some point in the course of the novel, Lenny makes a, a horrible mistake. He's, he's a character that, he's not super sharp, and he, makes mistakes, Lenny is, and I might be able to reread it at some point, of my and Men. Or if I can just do for you all a quick recap. trying to read something that's going to take a long time. I'm kind of just looking for a brief synopsis. Yeah, 
even the summary is like five paragraphs long. I'm reading this. It's the story of George and Lenny's friendship tested by the isolating and predatory reality of life of poor migrant workers in Depression era America. a story of like partnership brotherhood um friendship the dream of one day purchasing a farm is complicated by Lenny's inability to stay out of trouble on the job and George's inability to stay angry at Lenny long enough to leave and find work on his own yeah there's a whole team dynamic but yeah it's going to take me a minute to recap of my cement. But yeah, of my cement is coincidentally also the chapter title of this chapter in Sapiens as well. And historically, mice have been used in experiments to test like different reactions to different medicines and stuff like that. It's like pilot studies. And we kind of also see that evidenced in the film Legend with uh, Will Smith. Uh, I Am Legend, sorry. I Am Legend with Will Smith. It's like they test it out on the mice. And it's it also reminds me a little bit of that story like Flowers for Algernon. It's like the mice people take care of, like some some people take care of the mice and mice are compared to humans also in the song um, by Smashing Pumpkins uh, Bullet Bullet with Butterfly Wings Despite all my rage I am still just a rat in a cage Okay but anyway, <laughs> on, with, on with the show. Biological engineering is deliberate human intervention on the biological level, implanting a gene. Aiming at modifying an organism's shape, capabilities, needs, or desires in order to realize some preconceived cultural idea, such as the artistic predilections of Eduardo Cat. I don't always get all the references of, of Yuval in this book. Eduardo Cac is himself a Brazilian American contemporary artist and professor whose artwork span a wide range of practices, including performance art, poetry, holography, interactive art, telematic art, and transgenic art. So he's a Brazilian artist, basically. Okay. There's nothing new about biological engineering per se. People have been using it for millennia in order to reshape themselves and other organisms. It's like uh, laser eye surgery. I guess laser, laser eye surgery isn't really... I guess it could be seen as bioengineering. It's like changing DNA, how our bodies are wired in better ways. <sighs> Superhumans. A simple example is castration. Humans have been castrating bulls for perhaps 10,000 years in order to create oxen. Oxen are less aggressive and are thus easier to train to pull plows. Humans also castrate their own young males to create soprano singers with enchanting voices and eunuchs 
who could safely be entrusted with overseeing the Sultan's harem. Pretty dang fascinating. fascinating. But recent advances in our understanding of how organisms work down to the cellular and nuclear levels have opened up previously unimaginable possibilities. For instance, we can today not merely castrate a man, but also change his sex through surgical and hormone treatments. But that's not all. Consider the surprise, disgust, and consternation that ensued when in 1996 the following photograph appeared in newspapers on television. And let me show you guys. It looks like a mouse, and it's got a growth. Caption reads, a mouse on whose back scientists grew an ear made of cattle cartilage cells. It's an eerie echo of the lion man statue from the Statel Cave. 30,000 years ago, humans were already fantasizing about combining different species. Today, they can actually produce such chimeras. The Lion Man statue. Uh, what is it? Stale cave. Okidoki, the Lion Man is an Ice Age masterpiece. Um, it's also known as the Lowen Mensch figurine. What is its true significance? I think it's mythology, it's kind of like the Minotaur. People, as he said, imagining what people could be like with different animal characteristics. It's kind of like Beast Boy from Teen Titans. Like, you can get the power of a bull by changing into a bull and bear. But in this case, we're just using science and DNA. No, Photoshop was not involved. It's an untouched photo of a real mouse on whose back scientists implanted cattle cartilage cells. The scientists were able to control the growth of the new tissue, shaping it in this case into something that looks like a human ear. The process may soon enable scientists to manufacture artificial ears, which could then be implanted in humans. Even more remarkable wonders can be performed with genetic engineering, which is why it raises a host of ethical, political, and ideological issues. And it's not just pious monotheists who object that man should not usurp God's role. Well, it's like, look at Helen Keller. <laughs> it's like, she was born without vision, without hearing. I think she would like to have the ability to see things. I think she would like to have the ability to hear things. It's like, we shouldn't let religion prevent people from living their best lives. That's my opinion. Like, let's, let's try to help people as much as we can. I think if there was a God, he or she would want us to do that, right? Help people live their best lives, improve people's livelihoods, use science, medicine, technology to improve the world around us, eliminate hunger and poverty. Like, that's probably what any divine entity, if one were to exist, would want us to do. And that's just me. Many confirmed atheists are no less shocked by the idea that scientists are stepping into nature's shoes. Animal rights activists decry the suffering causes to lab animals in genetic engineering experiments, and to the farmyard animals that are engineered in complete disregard of their needs and desires. Human rights activists are afraid that genetic engineering might be used to create supermen who will make serfs of the rest of us. Jeremiah's offer apocalyptic visions of biodictatorships that will clone fearless soldiers and obedient workers. 
The prevailing feeling is that too many opportunities are opening too quickly and our ability to modify genes is outpacing our capacity for making wise and farsighted use of this skill. Yes, it's never a bad idea to consider the implications of what you're doing, creating, or um, prototyping like try to predict as much as you can what will come of what you're creating at times it can be hard hard to foresee what we can't yet see the result is that we're at present using only a fraction of the potential of genetic engineering most of the organisms now being engineered are those with the weakest political lobbies, plants, fungi, bacteria, and insects. For example, lines of E. coli, a bacterium that lives symbiotically in the human gut, and which makes headlines when it gets out of the gut and causes deadly infections, have been genetically engineered to produce biofuel. E. coli and several species of fungi have also been engineered to produce insulin, thereby lowering the cost of diabetes treatments. A gene extracted from an arctic fish has been inserted into potatoes, making the plants more frost resistant. Few mammals have been subject to genetic engineering. Every year, the dairy industry suffers billions of dollars in damages due to mas uh, mastitis. I'm make sure I'm pronouncing it correctly. Mastitis, yeah. It's an inflammation of the mammary gland in the breast or udder, typically due to bacterial infection via a damaged nipple or teat. A disease that strikes dairy cow udders. Scientists are currently experimenting with genetically engineered cows whose milk contains lysostatin, a biochemical that attacks the bacteria responsible for the disease. The pork industry, which has suffered from falling sales because consumers are wary of the unhealthy fats in ham and bacon, has hopes for a still experimental line of pigs implanted with genetic material from a worm. The new genes cause the pigs to turn bad omega-6 fatty acid into its healthy cousin, omega-3. Yeah, it's like science. It will improve lives. We need to encourage and support science and research for the betterment of humankind and yeah it's gonna at times require us to take a 360 look at the world around us all of the impacts that it's having and consequences etc etc the next generation of genetic engineering will make pigs with good fat look like child's play. Geneticists have managed not merely to extend sixfold the average life expectancy of worms, but also to engineer genius mice that display much improved memory and learning skills. Voles are small, stout rodents resembling mice, and most varieties of voles are promiscuous. But there is one species in which boy and girl voles form lasting and monogamous relationships. Geneticists claim to have isolated the genes responsible for vole monogamy. If the addition of a gene can turn a vole Don Juan into a loyal and loving husband, are we far off from being able to genetically engineer not only the individual abilities of rodents and humans, but also their social structures? Evil has a lot of interesting discussion points in this chapter. Definitely, it's like the effect the impact of bioengineering. What implications is he going to have? And similarly, what outcomes is this going to have for humans? Humans and animals. I don't know. They're interesting questions, certainly. And who knows... My hope would be that this research would help and allow people to live better, more fulfilling lives, improve people's livelihoods, eliminate
create problems in our world and society. Science has that power and ability, and that's why funding for research is so important. In the next chapter, we'll be taking a look at the return of Neanderthals and yeah, it's, we'll have, to, we'll probably take a look back into history, previous iterations, the sapiens, our evolutionary tree and line to learn and extract what meaning that we can from the development of our race and species. More on the topic of science research and development for the purpose of improving human lives and outcomes stem cell research is one example of this where it's like they're using stem cells to uh, help people who have visual impairments I think stem cells are versatile in what the, they're able to be used for. It's like, even just Googling it, it's like stem cell therapy, knees, arthritis, muscle growth, hair loss. And yes, vision, it's like those stem cells can be used for any one of a number of applications. And that, in turn, I think, reflects the possibilities that are possible with advancements in science, medicine, technology. It's like they can help people who weren't able to see, people who have debilitating conditions like dementia, I guess is perhaps one example. It's like it can help people with their conditions. So why not allow scientists to help people? It's a good thing, I think. Okay, Warren Sapiens. We are in chapter 27, as a matter of fact. I hope my... Uh, yeah, I think my categories. Chapter 27, it should be anyway. At the appointed hour, the prince, powdered and shaven, entered the dining room where his daughter-in-law, Princess Mary, and Mademoiselle Brienne were already waiting him together with his architect, who, by a strange capri of his employers, was admitted to table through the position of that insignificant individual with such as could certainly not have caused him to expect that honor. The prince, who generally kept very strictly to social distinctions and rarely admitted very important, uh, even important government officials to his table, had unexpectedly selected Michael Ivanovich, who always went into a corner to blow his nose on his checked handkerchief to illustrate the theory that all men are equals, and had more than once impressed on his daughter that Michael Ivanovich was not a wit worse than you or I. At dinner, the prince usually spoke to the taciturn Michael Ivanovich more often than to anyone else. In the dining room, which all the rooms in the house was exceedingly lofty, the members of the household had the footmen, one behind each chair, stood waiting for the prince to enter. The head butler, napkin on arm, was scanning the setting of the table, making signs to the footman and anxiously glancing from the clock to the door by which the prince was to enter. Prince Andrew was looking at large gilt frame, new to him, containing the genealogical tree of the princess Bolkonsky. Uh, interestingly, princess is misspelled here. There's only one S. But that could be because of the way the book's edited. I, my understanding is this was translated from Russian originally. Opposite which hung another such frame with a badly painted portrait, evidently by the hand of the artist belonging to the estate of a ruling prince. In a crown, an alleged descendant of Rurik, an ancestor of the Bokonskis. Prince Andrew, looking again at the genealogical tree, shook his head, laughing as a man laughs who looks at a portrait so characteristic of the original as to be amusing. Some portraits are very similar to the reality. 
think that reflects the talent and ability of the author. It's like the more art resembles the reality, the more skilled the author, the artist and author of the work is. How thoroughly like him that is, he said to Princess Mary, who had come up to him. Princess Mary looked at her brother in surprise. She did not understand what he was laughing at. Everything her father did inspired her with reverence and was beyond question. Everyone has his Achilles heel, continued Prince Andrew. Fancy, with his powerful mind, indulging in such nonsense. Princess Mary could not understand the boldness of her brother's criticism and was about to reply, when the expected footsteps were heard coming from the study. The prince walked in quickly and jauntily, as was his wont, as if intentionally contrasting the briskness of his manners with the strict formality of his house. At that moment, the great clock struck two, and another with a shrill tone joined in from the drawing room. The prince stood still, his lively glittering eyes from under their thick, bushy eyebrows sternly scanned all present and rested on the little princess. She felt, as courtiers do when the Tsar enters, the sensation of fear and respect, which the old man inspired in all around him. He stroked her hair and then patted her awkwardly on the back of her neck. Yeah. What I really like about War and Peace is that Leo gives us the idea of what like Russia was like at that time. And I've always liked history and archaeology for that reason, that it helps us put together the picture of what life was like at that time, like a record. I'm glad, glad to see you, he said, looking attentively into her eyes, and then quickly went to his place and sat down. Sit down, sit down, sit down, Michael Ivanovich. Uh, again, and here it says Ivanovich, but we know it's Ivanovich. He indicated a place beside him to his daughter-in-law. A footman moved the chair for her. Ho ho! Said the old man, casting his eyes on her rounded figure. You've been in a hurry. That's bad. He laughed in his usual dry, cold, unpleasant way, with his lips only, and not with his eyes. It's like. <laughs> It's like he keeps his eyes the same, and it's like he's he's just laughing. He's like, ha ha ha. You must walk. Walk as much as possible. As much as possible, he said. <laughs> the little princess did not or did not wish to hear his words. Yeah, most women don't like it when you critique their figure. <laughs> Even when you're complimenting their bodies, it usually doesn't go over well. <laughs> she was silent and seemed confused. The prince asked her about her father, and she began to smile and talk. He asked about mutual acquaintances, and she became still more animated and chattered away, giving him greetings from various people and retailing the town gossip. Countess Apraxina, a poor thing, has lost her husband, and she cried her eyes out. She said, growing more and more lively. As she became animated, the prince looked at her more and more sternly, and suddenly, as if he had studied her sufficiently and had formed a definite idea of her, he turned away and addressed Michael Ivanovich. Well, Michael Ivanovich, our Bonaparte will be having a bad time of it. Yeah, I'm just wondering when we're gonna get to the action. It's like they're on the verge of war. It's like we should be on a battlefield any any chapter now. Prince Andrew, he always spoke thus of his son, has been telling me what forces are being collected against him. While you and I never thought much of him. Michael Ivanovich did not at all know when you and I had such had said such things about Bonaparte, but understanding that he was wanted as a peg on which to hang the prince's favorite topic, he looked inquiringly at the young prince, wondering what would follow. He's a great tactician, said the prince to his son, pointing to the architect. And the conversation again turned on the war, on Bonaparte, and on the generals and statesmen of the day. The old prince seemed convinced not only that all the men of the day were mere babes, uh, were mere babies, who did not know the ABC of war or politics, and that Bonaparte was an insignificant little Frenchie, successful only because there were no longer any Potemkins or Severovs left to repose him. But he was also convinced that there were no political difficulties in Europe and no real war, but only a sort of puppet show at which the men of the day were playing, pretending to do something real. <laughs> yeah. 
He's like, back in my day, we actually knew how to fight in wars. None of this Mamby Pamby stuff they got nowadays. Prince Andrew gaily bore with his father's ridicule of the new men, and drew him on and listened to him with evident pleasure. The past always seems good, said he, but did not Severov himself fall into a trap Moreau set him, and from which he did not know how to escape. Who told you that? Who? cried the prince. Suvorov. He jerked away his plate, which Tikhon briskly caught. Suvorov, consider. Prince Andrew, too. Frederick and Suvorov. Moreau. Moreau would have been a prisoner if Suvorov had been had had a free hand. But he had Hoss Craig's worst schnapps wrath on his hands. It would have puzzled the devil himself. When you get there, you'll find out what those Hoff's Kriegs worst rats are. Sivarov couldn't manage them, so what chance has Michael Kutuzov? No, my dear boy, he continued. You and your generals won't get on against Bonaparte. You'll have to call on the French, so that birds of a feather may fight together. The German Palin has been sent to New York in America to fetch the Frenchman Moreau. He said, alluding to the invitation made that year to Moreau to enter the Russian service. Wonderful. Were the Potemkins, Sivarovs, and Orlovs Germans? No, lad. Either you fellows have all lost your wits, or I have outlived mine. May God help you. But we'll see what will happen. Bonaparte has become a great commander among them. <laughs> I don't at all say that all the plans are good, said Prince Andrew. I am only surprised at your opinion of Bonaparte. You may laugh as much as you like, but all the same, Bonaparte is a great general. I mean, yeah, it's like looking back now, he's pretty darn good. I think he's one of the best generals in history. Michael Ivanovich, cried the old prince to the architect, who, busy with his roast meat, hoped he'd been forgotten. Didn't I tell you Bonaparte was a great tactician? Here, he says the same thing. To be sure, your excellency, excellency replied the architect. Prince again laughed his frigid laugh. Like, he's right up there with uh, Alexander the Great. Like, he knew what he was doing at the head of the army. Bonaparte was born with a silver spoon in his mouth. He's got splendid soldiers. Besides, he began by attacking Germans. And only idlers, idlers have failed to beat the Germans. Yeah, and even Germany has his camp far away. Since the world began, everybody has beaten the Germans. They beat no one, except one another. He made his reputation fighting them. And the prince began explaining all the blunders, which, according to him, Bonaparte has made in his campaigns and even in politics. His son made no rejoinder, but it was evident that, whatever arguments were presented, he was as little able as his father to change his opinion. He listened, refraining from a reply, and involuntarily wondered how this old man, living alone in the country for so many years, could know and discuss so minutely and acutely all the recent European military and political events. You think I'm an old man and don't understand the present state of affairs, concluded his father. But it troubles me. I don't sleep at night. Come now, where has this great commander of yours shown his skill, he concluded. That would take too long to tell, answered the son. Well, then go to your Bonaparte. Mademoiselle Borean, here's another admir admirer of that powder monkey emperor of yours. He ex exclaimed in excellent French. Wow. <laughs> you know, Prince, I am not a Bonapartist. Dicet quen reviendra, hummed the prince out of tune, and with a laugh still more so, he quitted the table. The little princess, during the whole discussion and the rest of dinner, sat silent, glancing with a frightened look now at her father-in-law and now Princess Mary. When they left the table, she took her sister-in-law's arm and drew her into another room. What a clever man your father is, said she. Perhaps that is why I'm afraid of him. 
Oh, he is so kind, answered Princess Mary. Uh, that's pretty interesting, like, who was the star at that time? Hold on a second, guys. 1805. Alexander the First. <laughs> it's said that he had a complicated relationship with Napoleon during the lengthy Napoleonic Wars. He changed Russia's position relative to France four times between 1804 and 1812 among neutrality, opposition, and alliance. Yeah, it's pretty fascinating. Yeah, we're just examining, like, all the relationships between these, like, Russian nobility, the French, French leaders all during this era. So, it's pretty dang fascinating. Props to Leo for writing about it, giving us a window into what it was like at that time. You can see all of the negotiations and diplomacy and the politics that are going on between the characters who are preparing for this huge historical event that they're just on the brink of. Yeah. Let's see what happens to these characters, how these events play out. And yeah, what unfolds. Thank you all for joining me on the Storm Show. Uh, of course, thank you for watching. Thank you for supporting the channel. And Storm Show signing off.